Welcome to What the Flick. It's <laughs> not, not a big deal to me. Uh, Jodie Foster is here. Hi there. And uh, I have a tremendous amount of uh, admiration for you. Oh, so I'm, thank I'm, you. I'm glad you're here. Um, and uh, delighted for the opportunity to get to talk to you. Uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of things, but among them, uh, you have a movie coming out, and I just saw you be a director, which was fantastic. <laughs> uh, Uh-oh. Because uh, we got a clip, which we'll play eventually from the movie, but the music was different, and you were just on it. You, it took you, when we played this clip, like, less, there's no <laughs> measurable amount of time for, for you to say, that's not the right music. Bang, like that. You know, we've been living with it for a while. Um, it's the best thing about being a director, honestly, is that it's a complete vision. And it should be, really, from beginning to end, from the time that you start developing the screenplay to the time you start going into production, casting, including budget and all the technical stuff, editing, and then the final process. So you clearly love directing, uh, yet this is just your fourth movie. Yes. Right. Um, uh, I, I sense, I don't, well, I don't know. Are there going to be more? Does this a direction you want to take your career? I, I, mean, I hope so, but you never know what happens. And right. in a month from now, maybe I'll never work again. You well, never yeah, know. It's true. Of but, course. Uh, that, I that, hope so. It's definitely what I've always wanted to do ever th since I was a little kid, really. More than acting? Yeah, more than acting. I mean, I guess because I was a child actor, I thought that by the time I turned 18, my career would be over. That's what everybody that's kept what, saying. That's what happens with and child then, actors. Um, right. And then everybody said, oh, yeah, but when you're 40, you'll never work again. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It's hard for me to believe sometimes that I'm an actor, I, even though I've done it for so long. Uh, it's not really my personality. I'm not that guy. You don't um, carry yourself in the manner that I am used to <laughs> okay. of a Hollywood star. <laughs> you, 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 you walked into this building today. With my sandals just, on. Just a, you were just <laughs> kind of a person. Um, and, uh, and, I, and, and much of that is unfair to many of your brethren mm -hmm. in the community because many of them are, are also regular people, but we have an image. And then when somebody meets the, that image of sort of some sort of nuttiness or entitlement, we tend to ascribe that behavior to all of them. Well, they're entitled real estate brokers as well they out are. there. <laughs> they are. Yeah, um, it's a funny job, you know, and it, it's um, it's a job that's allowed me. A, it's the best film school I could have ever had, right. being an actor. Um, but it also allowed somebody like me, who lives in their head a lot, um, to express themselves emotionally and creatively in ways that I might not never have found before. So I'm very grateful to having been an actor. And um, it's true, it's a weird fit for me because it's not really my personality. I'm not like the kind of person who dances on the table and does imitations. Right. Um, but I think that's maybe that's, what's ma made my work different. That changes my next line of questioning. But uh -oh. I was going to ask you to, to dance on the table. Okay. So let me just cross that. Maybe later. Let me cross that out. Um, the, uh, <laughs> so uh, before we get to uh, the movie, uh, I note I, you have uh, oh, you've done four movies, um, a Little Man Tate, right. Home for the Holidays, The Beaver, and, and Money Monster, um, and but also Orange is the New Black and House of Cards, so yes. television. Because television, when you started out, when you were doing television, you did a lot of TV mm -hmm. as a kid. Television is a, it's a completely different world. It's not even, it's almost, it's not even the same thing. Yeah, well, it's all changed. And, um, you know, that's what we love about the movie business and the television business, entertainment business. It changes over time, and, and there have been a lot of changes in the film business. Uh, but right now, Narrative is really on cable, yeah, and it's uh, really an exciting time, especially for actors, um, because they can kind of go back and forth, and they can have an arc in a season that runs for, you know, and television that runs for eight seasons, right? As opposed to a feature film where they're really, you know, they have an hour and a half movie and they're dedicated to that, but it's all they can do is have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and that's it. But that eight season arc that existed when you were making yep. shows in the early 70s and into the 80s, but I suspect that, that if you'd been asked in 1989 to right. direct an episode of, I don't even know if ER was on the air, but LA <laughs> Law or ER, you would have been like, no, I'm not gonna, it's not the same, and those were actually fairly good shows, but it's not the same kind of arc that we have now. Not yeah, the same that's kind true, of There's, they're, they're doing all sorts of interesting things, yeah. and um, yeah, the world has changed, you know, they don't have commercials, There's uh, they're not uh, censored quite as much, yeah. um, there's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's it's new and different, um, it's an opportunity to express yourself differently, I mean, it's true, I only made four feature films over a really long period of time, <laughs> I started when I was 27, and you know, here I'm 53, I've only made four, but I've I've not gotten off the ground many films, Oh, good. Good for you. <laughs> Lots Great. of movies have ended yeah. up uh, not getting off the ground, and I had a big career, and I, you know, had kids and did other right. things, and um, 
But I do feel like now is uh, the time to really focus on directing. So uh, Money Monster, where, uh, which opens uh, on Friday the 13th. Yes, it does. Um, an auspicious uh, day. An auspicious day. <laughs> what, um, I mean, nowhere like in the, in the press notes is the, the word mad money mentioned. But Jim uh -huh. Cramer's show on CNBC seems like the, at least is an inspiration. I, I, well, I know you're going to be surprised to hear that our our movie is not based on Jim Cramer. <laughs> um, but he is, you know, he's yeah. the most famous financial right. host that's out there, and right. he does some pretty wacky things. Um, George Clooney in the movie plays Lee Gates, who's a, who's a financial host. Uh, a little smoother, a little more suave and Georgie. Right. Right. But, like um, but, but does use some props and um, uses a lot of um, actually film images behind him to illustrate his point charts and crazy things and bells and whistles and technology. Um, but that's all over, you know, that's a, all over the TV now. Why I'm mostly interested in this movie is because, you know, on the show, on the, on the Young Turks, and, and I started as a TV yes. journalist, I spent nine years, that was how I came mm -hmm. into this business. And my brother is a correspondent on Dateline NBC, and wow. a really good one. Um, but, and, and I, to me, date, shows like Dateline are the best shows, news shows on TV, because at least that's, honest. There was a murder and you have the story of the murder. It may not be important. It may not be changing the world the way we sort of imagine yeah. Cronkite and Ed Murrow. Right. But television news, and that would include financial news, mm -hmm. I think we should stop expecting, <laughs> let's stop expecting greatness because they haven't delivered greatness in a long time. Well, it's an interesting time. You know, you, we talk about features and television changing. Well, you know, news has really changed. And the idea of what a journalist is has changed dramatically. And over the course of the last 20 years, um, are, you know, because of the advent of digital technology, um, we've gotten into this groove where entertainment and news is starting to have a very fine line. And uh, the journalists that one had once had, you know, serious criteria for how they did their job are now kind of blurring into the, you know, how many funny hats can I wear and how many dancing girls can I have. Um, it's a weird time for politics and for reality television and for narrative, um, all of them blending together. And I don't think it's doing any favors to uncovering the truth. No, it's not, nor democracy, nor, right. No, it, we're, not, we're not a better place because <laughs> of it. Uh, I, I have an interview coming up, I mentioned to you, with Faye Dunaway, so I've been doing all this research mm -hmm. on network. And the reaction of, and, and I, 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 oddly, this happens, mm -hmm. that you were also nominated for an Oscar the same year that network was for, yes. your, for a taxi driver. Um, and... But there are comments about network. The mainstream media's reaction to network was so hostile. Sidney right. Lumet, who directed network, yes. was barred by NBC from going to a made-for-TV movie screening. They were like, no, you're wow. not welcome here because of what you've suggested wow. about us. Edwin Newman, a great, great, great old-school journalist from the Cronkite era, was outraged that this would never happen. Right. Right. And now we look at network now and you think, well, yeah, that seems about right. Maybe, okay, they're not plotting a murder, right. but it's pretty close. Well, at the time, I mean, it was really satire. And yeah, right. you know, Americans aren't that comfortable with satire. That's, That's right. always been more of a European uh, uh, form. Uh, but that was real satire and, uh, you know, beautifully written. And, and maybe that kind of thing might not have happened, but it was pretty prescient because Incredibly that kind of thing prescient. could definitely happen now. Um, our film is in the tradition of Sidney yeah. Lumet, the great Sidney Lumet. Yeah. I mean, we could never make a movie as beautiful as either Dog Day Afternoon or Network, right. but... Um, we certainly live in his shadow, and, and what an honor. Um, so uh, in, in this movie, uh, Jack O'Connell plays a uh, somebody who we learn about as the movie goes mm -hmm. along, but as we're, we'll take a look at the clip, but he bursts into the studio with a show hosted by Clooney, and his executive producer is, is Julia Roberts. Uh, yeah, he's, out a gun. he's a regular guy who... Um, who listened to what Lee said on his program and uh, has always done the right thing and decided to invest as a, as a, as a stockholder. And um, there was a glitch and he happened to lose everything that he had. Right, um, so disgruntled and upset, he comes on to the television broadcast. All right, let's take a look. At Just boom him in, chirp, 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 see what happens. Company for the last few months, hopefully you can listen to your little birdie. You got delivery? Don't move. This is a union thing. Oh, Jesus! Oh, Jesus! Jesus! Turn those cameras back on! Turn those cameras back on! Jesus Christ! Whoever's in there, turn those cameras Jesus back Christ. on I, right now! I, I, I can't. Once I turn them off, you're lying! Up in his head! Turn those cameras off, Patty! Patty. Turn them on! Patty! 
Right, I'm gonna count to three. Okay. And I swear to God, I'm do pulling something. this trigger. Patty. One. Patty, what do you want me to do? Turn them off, Patty. Two. Turn them off, what do you want me to do? Turn Put it up. Wow. And then she doesn't turn them on, and George Clooney <laughs> is killed. That's a, it's a, I would have gone a different route, but you're a professional, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, Jack O'Connell was in Unbroken. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The, the and many Angela. other wonderful British movies, including uh, a television stint he done on Skins. Everybody's British. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's freaking British. British. Um, so now, again, the idea that a gunman would come in mm -hmm. outraged and it would be broadcast on television, it's not, again, like we saw it in network and it did. It seemed outrageous. It was satire. Thank you for pointing that out. And now, 40 years later, I don't know. It seems. It, well, there is a satirical bend to the film, too. Yeah. You know, there's a bit of absurdity in it. Um, but for mostly, it's really, uh, you know, th that is the backdrop um, the backdrop of Wall Street and the financial world and a disgruntled man coming to sort of figure out what happened to his money. Um, but mostly, it's a character drama. You know, it's a, a character drama about these two men, this sort of strange brotherhood that. Happens uh, while he while Lee Gates is being held hostage. George Clooney's been held hostage, um, and then the producer of the show, played by Julia Roberts, who's kind of producing their survival and um, doing a, a little bit of a better job than the police at the time of figuring out what's going to happen. Right, and so I also imagine and trying to figure out what what happened. Yes, that's what's going to be the story. Right. Uh, and 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 against this backdrop in the middle of this campaign, I mean that I guess why this movie is. Well timed. Yeah. Uh, that yes. We, have a we didn't do it on purpose. Uh, no, but I mean, well, you ta then then you successfully tapped into the same anger that Bernie Sanders did. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, the the film has been around for for a little while, and we brought on a young uh, writer to come in and and really, in some ways, make it more relevant and say what's what's really happening today, and um, the world of technology and the world of finance. You know, the melting of those two and all of the problems that come out of that was something that he really wanted to explore, and it just so happens that you know all of that is is part of the dialogue today in this new political campaign. Um, is this the craziest uh, uh, campaign you <laughs> witnessed? Do you, are you political at all? You have, you're somewhat political. I am not. No. Um, I just make movies. It's yeah. all I ever wanted to do is make movies. Um, I do tend to make movies about the world, so uh, and not about space and Mars and all right, of that, right. so I do tend to make more movies about what's happening now. And um, I'm always more interested in the dramatic side and in the character side and how that reflects the backdrop, you know. But we are at a time, obviously, when there is a widespread dissatisfaction with Wall Street. And interestingly, and what I imagine is going to work in this movie, is that we know there's, we know that it's unfair. But getting regular people, myself included, and you, I imagine, to explain exactly why it's unfair <laughs> is very difficult to do. Right. But there's this sense of frustration and outrage that, hey, this wasn't, whatever this was, this wasn't right and it's not a game and it's not a little fun TV show. Yeah, and the outrage is shared by all, by left and right yes, as well. Right. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not like we're taking one side. Um, all, all, the, the film really, you know, the, one of the ways that, uh, the, that the financial world has been able to uh, orchestrate the power that they have is by making it all so complicated that regular people can't understand it. So right. they created the rules, the impenetrable rules. They created a system that is impossible to understand so that they can benefit from that misunderstanding. Right, because when something's impossible to understand, it is almost impossible to change. And there is a few people that have the keys to that, and those people right. that have the keys to that are the ones that are benefiting the most financially. Um, you know, we know that's true. We've known that's true for a very long time. That is how the system works. And um, for the most part, it works pretty well. And uh, I think this film, you know, doesn't say the system doesn't work. I think what it says is there are lots of abuses and there are lots of opportunities for abuses. We certainly saw that in 2008. Right. And um, now the financial world just has to find new ways to abuse, this, abuse the system. And uh, we're going to be looking at that, uh, that those, you know, bubble crash, bubble crash, bubble crash. For a long, long time. Yeah, and we just have to hope that the crashes aren't so dramatic, because. It, but it in is, the quest for right. for larger returns and the quest for larger yeah. margins, um, those crashes are going to have to be more dramatic. If you want to make, if you want to make some omelets, you got to break that, some eggs. I got to be honest, Jody. That makes it sound like the movie's a little bit political. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. 
Uh, you know, no. I mean, I think you'll take away from no, it. No, I don't mean like it's advocating right. one candidate, but I mean it is recognizing a, a specific yes. problem as a very serious problem right. that affects regular people in a very serious way. Well, and there's a character in the movie that really represents Wall Street. And uh, at the end of the day, when we track him down and say, you know, what do you have to say to all of this? He says, you know, it's funny, you weren't complaining when we were making you money. That's right. You were happy to lap up as many stocks as you possibly could, and um, you were looking the other way when everything was, you know, when, it, when you were making those m massive returns. And if you really want to be competitive, if you say that you want to be competitive, then you have to take these risks and you have to go uh, over, the, over what, you know, the regulations are. Because if you don't, it's just going to be the Chinese and the Russians that are going to win. Right. Um, that's true, too. So That's we do have all points of view. I think in all of my films, there really are, everybody's point of view matters. Um, yes, though there are, and there are, and I think one thing that is, is certainly frustrating for me in a, in a campaign, especially even in this office where I argue with a lot of people yes. consistently, uh, is that there are multiple truths existing at the same time. And that's why they really, call it drama. Yeah, well, that, that, that's, <laughs> that, that works well for you guys. Um, so the, the obvious questions I have to get out of the way sure. that I don't like. But I mean, you're, you know, come on. You're like, it's, it's George Clooney and Julia Roberts. There's a degree of just like, <laughs> they're awesome. That. They're yeah. awesome. And uh, they're wonderful together. And it's amazing. You know, they they're really aren't on screen for most of the movie. They're on, on screen for two minutes in the beginning and two minutes at the end. And yet they have this virtual relationship in the film where Julia speaks into his ear through an earpiece. And he was it looks her speaking to her when you shot? Was no. The, no. So. No. They were nowhere near each other. Really? And yet, um, sort of the magic of their chemistry and their dynamic really shines through in the film. They really are brother and sister. This uh, fourth, I think the fourth movie. They've done together. Is it? A couple of Oceans movies yeah. and uh, uh, Confessions of Confessions, the, the, the yeah. Clooney movie, right? Confessions right. of a Dangerous Mind. Um, so, um, uh, but I re read some interesting things about just how you put this together. Mm -hmm. So, was it shot sequentially? Is that right? No, no? not really. No? <laughs> well, it kind of was. We had to do all the stuff that was on the uh, on the Money Market stage, uh, the Money Monster stage. We had to do that mm -hmm. all together, and so that ended up being the first two two and a half weeks of shooting. Uh, and uh, I read, again, this is more for, I suppose, deep film buffs, yes. but some of it, like the stuff that's on television, shot with television cameras, so it will look, the texture will literally be different than yeah, it is we, than, we have, than through We wanted film. to figure out how to really separate the d dramatic eye, so the film eye in some ways, uh, from, the, from the broadcast eye. And so we separated that uh, visually and, um, and also sort of psychologically by the lenses we used and and by how we position the cameras. So um, all of these cameras are going simultaneously. The, the four broadcast cameras, uh, sometimes there's three, but actually there's four broadcast cameras, and then the one, what we call the film camera, although it's not film. Right. Um, the film camera, which is uh, the dramatic eye of the film. And they do look different, right? Be some they do look different. Yeah. Um, you know, what's interesting about our film is that there is, it's all in real time, much like a lot of those Sidney Lumet movies. And um, it's one action happening, and it's happening all over the world. So we'll see something happen on the broadcast that we're watching. We'll experience it. But other people are watching it everywhere around the world, including the control room that has all of those monitors, the, the police that are watching downstairs, a, a coffee shop, uh, somebody in Korea, somebody in South Africa, somebody in Iceland. Um, all of them are participating in one event the way you can do right. these days yes, in the so modern right. world. And um, for all of our, for, for all of the things that are that bug us about technology, one of the best things is that it's it's really a democracy, uh, and um, all of these people are allowed to influence what happens on the screen. So you shoot this. So the movie takes place in real time, like yes, what, it does. like a hundred minutes, something like that. It's uh, an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, that's nice. It's more like two here. hours. So right. there's a little bit of cheating in there well, somewhere. That gets to a little like you. It's somewhat like it's really hard to do movies that take place. In real time. Well, people well, go to the bathroom. We never showed anybody going to the bathroom. Right. Well, we got to. They eat. They eat. Th they eat. Right, they <laughs> snack. They, they call home. I just got to send a quick text. There's probably not a lot of that. Um, uh, you wouldn't believe what's happening at work today. Hang on. I'll be right there. Um, uh, but it is. It can be limiting because you can. It can. It can. It can screw up. Uh, uh, it can screw up your sequencing. It's hard. To, yeah. you, you're. You get bound to that it's a, way of storytelling. It's a real challenge as a director because you have to create tone with the story. You can't just say you can't just cut and go. Meanwhile, right? You know, you each 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 piece. Each, let's just say it's in three acts or it's in seven acts. All of them have to have their own organic engine, 
Right. So uh, if the film starts off a certain way, then it has to gain in speed and momentum, and it has to keep that momentum until the end. Um, I I'm reading into this a little bit. I talked about this with Matt Atchity, who's the editor in chief of Rotten Tomatoes, this morning. We okay. did a Game of Thrones review. Uh -oh. No, no, it's just but like so in these these four movies you've directed, like there's a there's a significant outsider in at least two of them. Mm -hmm. Certainly in in Tate, right? Yes. Uh, and in The Beaver. Yes. Like they're uh, with uh, with Mel Gibson's character, and I and, 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 the and Home for the Holidays also certainly with yeah. Robert Downey Jr. and 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 maybe to some extent. By the way, let me just say a little bit about Home for the Holidays. Okay. It's like my favorite uh, holiday movie. I mean, it, and so uh, I, you probably don't watch, but whenever we do uh, uh, like Christmas movies, and mm -hmm. I realize it's Thanksgiving, but whenever we do holiday movies at at, at Turner Classic Movies, and we list the best ones. I always mention it. Aww. I always mention it. So you got to just, I'm just saying, pay attention and Thank you'll at you. least get me a And by the way, I know many of <laughs> you probably haven't seen 1995, Jodie Foster's Home for the Holidays. It's great. I don't know why I love it so much, but I do. Um, I mean, I love it because it's good, but for some reason, it's just every time. It, well, it, maybe because you're an outsider, you know? I mean, I think it's a, it, was, it was designed from the perspective of a 30-some-year-old person who once a year has to go back to their family and is completely infantilized. Right. And um, is torn in all the ways that they were when they were young and, and can't make sense of all this chaos. And so you have it again here to some extent. Well, I mean, you could, well, I, don't, I haven't seen the movie yet. Okay. You, uh, but, but, but Jack O'Connell's character obviously is, has been, at least has been rendered an outsider by the circumstances that have happened to him. And anybody who goes in with a gun into a live TV studio is, is certainly making themselves that way. Yeah, um, and maybe you know, the he's, character too. He's, he's the wisest character in the movie, and yet mm -hmm. he's the one that has, uh, he doesn't have an intellectual conversation. You know, he's the guy who comes in and says, I, I, this isn't fair. And um, everybody else says, oh yes it is, it was, it was a glitch, it was computers, uh, it's too difficult for you to understand. And he says, no, I'm not gonna take that answer. I wanna know what happened to my money. You know, look, I don't know you, but you seem super well adjusted. So, uh, <laughs> wow. but does that, but does that outsider surprised. thing, does that, do those types of stories, did, are you, were you drawn to those stories? I, I think that's more true of my, my first three films, and I mm -hmm. think this film is a bit of a departure in that area, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of things that I, I find again in this film. Um, you know, uh, certainly the film has uh, an intellectual side and an emotional side, and it's equally divided. Um, that's something that's true of all my films. Um, it's yeah, I, I suppose it's a group of unlikely people that come together, uh, almost like a little funny subset family. People that shouldn't belong together kind of come together to solve something. Right, and that's true in television. Even in, in I mean, I've been working in TV all my life, and you always there is a connection with the people. You know, not yeah. here, obviously. I could care less about these people. <laughs> um, no, you bond. You right, you bond, and it's a particular. You know, it's a, any time, any job that's a particularly stressful environment and where you feel and that's certainly true here like you're doing something important yeah um that brings you together um so uh i uh in we talked a little well, first of all before we get to that last okay. thing about this movie because we talked about tv yes. and you got a couple of big people who've succeeded enormously in this new world of tv dominic right. west of course right. and the affair uh katrina on, Balf. on showtime and what katrina Balf from outlander right and right mm -hmm. from Out outlander which i've only seen one episode of but right and uh uh, and Giancarlo Esposito, yes, from Breaking, Bad. Breaking and, Bad, and based on what we now know, coming up in season three of Better Call Saul, he's gonna, he's finally Yay. gonna show up. Well, and George Clooney from ER. And George Clooney <laughs> was on the program <laughs> ER. It's on the television program ER. Um, but again, like it's a different, like again, whatever. You're when you were making movies in the '80s, we weren't looking to TV to find That's stars, right. but these guys and, and and Dominic West was on The Wire. That's right. Also, well, and all so right. Yeah, yeah, it's liberating, isn't it? I mean, that actors can just act and right. they can act in lots of different places and play lots of different characters and over longer periods of time, and uh, that's a wonderful thing right now. Um, so nobody, hardly anybody, goes from being a successful child star to a, a to a successful grown-up actress. I don't, I don't really know why. It, it's you know, I'm interviewing at the film festival. Mm -hmm. um, oh man, I'm going to blow his name. So let's. That's a shame. Well, you'll be uh, editing it's that. It's okay. Out. Well, no, it's okay because it's uh, <laughs> it's the the uh, in. Did you see Cinema Paradiso? Yes. The kid. Yeah, so the I don't know the kid's name. Right, so Toto, the young Toto, who was mm. the Toto who you're left with. I mean, he was the adorable one He of the three people who played that guy in the movie. And I'm interviewing him at the festival, and he said, like, yeah, he gave it a shot. He says no bitterness whatsoever that he right. didn't succeed as an actor. He was in a bunch of movies. He's like, and look at the movie I made. It's like this great, wonderful thing, and I'm so happy to be a part of it. But when you're a kid, he's like, you just react. 
And then as you get to be a certain age, you realize, oh, I have to, now it's work. Now it right. takes work. It's not just that it is work, but that it takes work, it takes planning. And that is something that some people just can't do. Was there a, ever a moment for you? Is that something that ring true, first of all? Um, well, that's definitely true because mm. I, 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 you know, you, at 12 or 13 years old, it's not like you're sitting there going like, hmm, I wonder if this is going to add up. What's this going to add up to? And, you know, maybe I should send that person a note and tell them about these impressions I can do. Or, right. Um, but I, th I think the, the biggest reason that uh, child actors don't grow on to be uh, adult actors is that it's a different style of acting. And uh, most child actors are, are just asked, asked to be the child actor. You know, they're not really asked to grow into, you know, a full character. And I got lucky because I did get to play some really full characters. I didn't really... As, you mean in, like in Alice and, and in Taxi Driver? I don't anymore in Taxi Driver, Bugsy yeah. Malone, you know, even yeah. Little Girl is Down the Land. I mean, those were all movies where uh, it was into incidental what age they were. It, you did four movies in 1976. You mentioned Bugsy Malone, I? Taxi Driver. But those, again, those, are, those, were, those were characters. I mean, I guess you, you were 14 then, I think, something like that? I was 12 when I did Taxi Driver and Bugsy Malone. But uh, those are real, those were grown-up parts. I guess so. Yeah. I guess so. And, you know, my mom was amazing. My mom Is that was right? really amazing at, she was a, an incredible movie buff, and she really wanted me to have a career of somebody who was respected and who had a long career. And um, so she chose, maybe selfishly or, or w for a vicarious thrill in some way, she wanted me to be meaningful and to have a, a meaningful career. And I think that that ended up allowing me to have a better transition to adult acting. Is there a movie that you consider like your transition, or is it? No, I mean I had some awkward periods. I uh, um, I made some I didn't make some I made some movies that weren't that great, and then I went to college and I thought that oh well my career will be over, but I guess I'm going to go on to write and hopefully someday to be able to direct films. So um, I'm going to keep trying to squeeze this acting thing, but I know it's not going to pan out. And the people who uh, say the people who say I went to college and don't mention the college always went to a. Great <laughs> I did go to Yale, which oh, is an awesome yeah, place. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I really didn't think I but would be an actor when I grew up. But you stopped acting, right, when you went to Yale? Pretty no, much. I no? made five movies while oh, I was... I'm an idiot. I did, yeah, they, weren't, they didn't right. do very well, but I did five movies while I was there. And, um, and then I came out, and I did the six months of sleeping a lot when mm -hmm. you finish, saying, you know, what am I going to do next? And um, eventually I did The Accused, and, and my career started over again. So that was the, so post-college, that's where things... I think so, yeah. yeah. I think The Accused was the big one. Um, you still as pleased with that performance as I imagine you were at the time? Is it... I, I, thought, it, I thought it was terrible in that movie. That and right? um, I don't know what was wrong with me. I mean, I guess I, I, I had my own prejudices about myself on screen. And I was young. I didn't really understand what I was doing, maybe. And um, I was kind of embarrassed by the performance. And I thought, oh, I think I should go to grad school. Is that right? <laughs> so oh, I did my GREs thinking, oh, well, that's the end of me. I guess I'll go to grad school. And then the movie did well, and I kept acting. Um, uh, can you tell me a little bit about that Oscar night? Do we? Oh, the first Oscar yeah. night? Uh, the first Oscar that night. That was Look at fun. You, the first Oscar night. It was fun, <laughs> but I was by myself. I was the only one from the movie. So I was you know, running around trying to figure out what to do because there wasn't there wasn't anybody from the movie. So the second time I won for Silence of the Lambs, I think was more fun because everybody from the movie had won. Right. We so won all five categories, the top five categories, and we were all kind of running around with each other, sweating and mm -hmm. moving from thing to thing. And we all went to the same designated place. So it was a little bit more of a family. Had you won all the things that lead up to it before the accused? Like, so did you have a sense that you this was a good a bet? Yeah, to, a yeah. few of them. Um, I won the Golden Globe, but nobody else did, so mm. they were all bummed. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we, you know, it was an amazing year. Yeah. I mean, uh, Silence was a, an, an amazing experience, and uh, I just recently, it's the 25th anniversary of Silence, I just got to see everybody, Jonathan Demme and, and Ted Talley and, you know, all the actors, I got to see them in New York, and, um, you know, you, you, you forget that, um, you just forget it, you forget it all, you forget what an incredible wild ride it was. What's your best movie? What movie are you most proud of? Not directing. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I'm I probably Taxi Driver. I mean, I think Taxi Driver is really just a great American classic. Yeah. And I'm just 
can't believe that I got to be a part of the 70s in the golden age of American cinema. We were talking before, I'm interviewing Faye Dunaway at the festival, and I was telling her that, like, look, I think that, you, yeah. meaning Faye, is from 1967 to 77, if you go from, like, Bonnie and Clyde to Star Wars, like, the yeah. 10 most important years, maybe, in American cinema, and yes. she was, and, and yeah, and I'm, I'm realizing I'm telling you the story, and I'm like, oh, wait, you were, <laughs> <laughs> you count, you're in I, I guess I count, but I was so no. young, I think I was just wide-eyed, you know, I couldn't believe Maybe. it either at the time. Well, the point is, we don't know it then, we know it now, so you count, yeah. believe me, I, I have news for you. Um, so, uh, uh, did you give an answer there? Oh, Taxi Driver, yeah. Taxi Driver, I think Taxi Driver. Um, and and Taxi Driver and Silence, you know, uh, um, Silence, I, I feel like, the beauty of that movie really came out of Thomas Harris's typewriter when he when yeah. he created the book and and all of us did our best work and who knows maybe we'll never be as good as we all were in that movie when we came together um, it was just the book was so inspiring that I think everybody especially Ted Talley who wrote the screenplay it just came out of his just came out of his typewriter and into everybody's mouths you know because everybody would like me to make this interview uh, about me yes um, so whenever, <laughs> me as well whenever anyone calls me. Mm -hmm. Ever, I mean, this has happened seventy-eight times in my life, and uh, and and they're not there. I just say into the phone, Doctor Lecter, <laughs> Doctor Lecter, <laughs> Doctor Lecter, Dr. Lecter. Uh, and it always makes people laugh. It always, it makes it me all, laugh. It always every gets... time I hear it, which is a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. But it, it always. But usually, works. I hear the Chianti, the fava beans, and the Chianti. That's right, right, be the right. One no, people... that's not for me. I yeah. just like the Doctor Lecter. I like that. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, can I ask? So, first of all. I want to ask you about Mel Gibson, but I, I hope okay. it's okay. But because I, you know, I don't know him, so my reaction, all that stuff was different. I so admired your loyalty because he's your friend, and I think that speaks volumes um, about you. That makes this an easy question. Did you feel any fallout from that, or was that an easy call for you to make? Because look, this is your friend, and this is what you do. Um, well, there's two sides to him. I mean, yes, he's my friend, and he's somebody who's shown me great loyalty over the years, and who um, who I really love, and who's shown me a lot of love, and um, who's been there for me, and who's been supportive, um, and who conti continues to be. So that's a no-brainer. Right. Um, I can't stand up for his behavior, but I can certainly stand up for the man that I love. Um, but he also is a great artist. Yeah, he um, is. He yeah. is a, a phenomenal director. And uh, a wonderful actor, too, as we know, but he's a phenomenal director. And um, he is, uh, if you've ever run into anybody who's ever worked with him, he yeah, probably I, is the favorite actor, yeah. director that anybody ever works with. He's no, I have the heard favorite, that. favorite person for technicians as well as other actors. We started talking about this world that we live in, and, and if we expand that to the Internet and this instant reaction, mm -hmm. like you said, there are two sides. It, but, and, and, of course, I, I agree with you, and you don't have to, you can have both those sides. You can say, that was horrible, and... I'm going to give you a hug now, or whatever that whatever that effect is, and I'm going to or and I'm going to cast you in the movie I want to ask you about mm -hmm. because the Beaver was so interesting and mm -hmm. good. Um, you don't have to choose; you can do both. You can have both those reactions, somewhat related to what the the very there there are multiple truths. We don't have to decide one truth about people right. or events shaping the world. Yes, and um, you know he takes responsibility for his own behavior, and he's had to, and, and he'll live with the consequences of that for the rest of his life. But um, he has really shown up as an artist for me and for the movie. He was wonderful, uh, wonderful in The Beaver, and he gave everything. And he was the easiest person in the world to direct, and always on time, and only two or three takes. So I, I that's that's the man that I have to present is the man that I know. That was uh, that movie was so. Weird. Different, weird, but I mean weird <laughs> in all the ways that you want it to be weird, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that movie wasn't for everybody. I know that there were uh, lots of people that liked their genres nice and simple, you yeah. know, and they... Uh, I, don't know what, what, I don't know what genre I don't even know what genre in. it is. Yeah, yeah, that would but be. The, the film had the tone of the main character, and the main character was unstable. Yeah. Um, he's somebody who goes from being uh, deeply, deeply, deeply depressed, chemically depressed, to somebody who uh, the only way he can survive is to become completely deluded. And uh, and have a, a you know a, a complete fantasy about himself, and then he falls off a cliff at the end and has to accept himself for who he is. And the film has that tone, so it goes from being um, sort of seeming like it's going to be like a happy pappy Hollywood movie to um, <laughs> a, sort of a disturbing uh, phantasm yeah, uh, to a, happy, a film that really Hollywood. is about uh, regenerating yourself and and surviving. Um, 
And also, you know, I mean, so it's it's got Mel Gibson, it has you, Anton Yeltsin, Jennifer Lawrence. Like, Jennifer I for, Lawrence. I forgot yes. that it had Jennifer Lawrence until I went back and My looked My favorite it person. Uh, you know, this is a silly question, too, or just a, a rudimentary question, so I hate asking them, although I've asked a lot. Um, <laughs> okay. The, uh, uh, do you see her greatness early? I mean, she's already, it, it's not mm -hmm. like you've discovered her, but 2011 still, do we see, like, wow, this is a... Oh, yeah, it's undeniable. I mean, she uh, she really sent us uh, a tape. Really? I mean, I didn't even get to meet her. She sent in a tape herself that she made herself. And uh, I was like, wow, she's amazing. Uh, I went to see uh, uh, Winter's Bone. I went to mm -hmm. see a couple of pieces of Winter's Bone. And I said, wow, she is so extraordinary. Um, we should re... I would like to bring her onto this movie, and I'd like to rewrite the character for her. So there was not a part... For her? Yeah, there was, but it was different, and I and I saw I saw how great she was, and um, I wanted to rewrite the part uh, to reflect what's great about her, and um, and that that's something that you know you can do when you see somebody who's extraordinary. For the last, like even I guess, you know, because of the nature of TCM and the older stars that I interact yes. with, most most of whom overwhelmingly are wonderful and just mm -hmm. they tell great stories and they're appreciative and. But there is a degree of, I don't go to the movies anymore, yeah. right? And the movies are terrible and they don't tell any good stories. Right. And they're all the stars are all, you know, <laughs> they, and they use some horrible <laughs> pejorative word. And I, for years, I would say, you know, I use Clooney. I was like, mm -hmm. look, if George Clooney had been 35 years old in 1935, he'd have been Clark Gable. Like, right. it's not, he would have been a classic star then. But I think she would have also. And yes. so I, for, you know, tried to get them to be like, don't, don't rule again, don't rule out Jennifer Lawrence. See her and appreciate that sort of, she has a classic Hollywood way about her. Yeah, and you know, um, those two things, being a real creative moving actor and being a movie star don't have to be incompatible. Um, and um, you know, they don't have to be on opposite sides of the fence. I think, uh, and Money Monster is a good example of that. I mean, hopefully you can make a film that's a, a general public film, that's a genre film, that's a taut thriller. Um, that performs for people in some ways that way, but that also is really intelligent and that allows them to uh, to be challenged, allows an audience to be challenged. A couple more questions. That's hard to do now, though, isn't it? I mean, we yeah, have, it is. every movie is a, you know, we all know what the big successful movies are, the franchises, and this is obviously not about right. to be a franchise. Not one of those. This is a one-off. Um, uh, but you still have, you know, you still got the big stars in it. You got many of the things needed yep. to make a hit, but... It's like you either make a movie like The Beaver, which, by the way, everybody who hasn't seen right. should go see, but that not a lot of people see. Right. Or you have to make a uh, you have to make a Superman movie, and then you try to find this acceptable middle ground. Yeah, it's a weird time in the film business. Lots has changed. Um, how people's habits have changed. You know, what, going to the theater has changed for people. People, a lot of people don't go to the theater anymore, or if they do, they want to only see a franchise film. And so, um, and that really is a byproduct of how the studio end of the industry has kind of changed its own industry. Um, but I just make movies, and uh, I make small ones, I make big ones, I make comedies, I make dramas, um, I do television. Uh, that's all I've ever really wanted to do, and I feel like if you're a creative person, you know, you're gonna figure out how to tell your stories. Because I work at TCM, I have to ask you about two people before we go. James sure. Garner. Oh, I love James Garner. He's my favorite. I did yeah. Maverick with James Garner, but I also did a little-known uh, Disney movie with him years before. I was probably about 10 years old, and it was me and a camel <laughs> and, uh, and him in the West. Um, just a great guy, fun, bright, uh, great sense of humor, just a lovely, lovely man. Uh, anybody who works at TCM, you, your first credit, I think, you were on the Doris Day show. I don't know if that was my first credit, but yeah, I was on the Doris Day show. I don't remember anything about it, but I, yeah, I, I was. No Doris Day memories? Not really. Sorry. No, it's um, okay. I, had to, I gotta ask. I d yeah, right. I did a it's, lot I'm, of shows that I contract. had vague memories. Yeah. You know, I was on the Lucille Ball show. I was... How were you? So the Partridge Family, Partridge all these shows, how were you not on the Brady Bunch? What gives? Yeah, I don't think I was on the Brady Bunch. That's an outrage. Um, I don't know how yeah. that happened. I, I did My Three Sons. I did... Um, yeah, right. I did. I did pretty much every television show in the 70s. Um, but that was a show about kids. And you were a kid. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know. I think maybe I was the wrong, you know, because I, I was blonde and looked kind of like them. I think they were like, no, oh, let's right, avoid yeah. her. So you could have been a you could have been a sister. Maybe, yeah. maybe. Um, you're a I think actually, I think I, I actually auditioned for that and didn't yeah. get it. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure I remember that. You couldn't uh, yeah. you couldn't hold up to those guys. They were I too good. It was I a team. Hold up to it.
Uh, you're a match for uh, coming in and spending this much time. I my pleasure, it. my so, pleasure. So great. Uh, Jody Foster, everybody. Uh, uh, Money Monster, Friday, May 13th. Uh, also... Freaky Friday. Freaky Friday. So before then, uh, go... First of all, rent home for the holidays. Everybody should. <laughs> and go see the, the Beaver. It's super weird and super good. Uh, and uh, great pleasure to have Jody Foster here. Thanks, everybody.